This is my first time tabling at a comic convention. I, how do I feel about uh, tabling at a convention? Uh, I am, I'm excited and I'm also pretty nervous. Um, but I'm looking forward to just seeing who happens to walk up and, you know, talking to people as they look through things and excited to see if anybody uh, checks them out. To prepare myself, I came, I came to Heroes Con last year and shadowed another comic, indie comic writer. And, um, you know, I was able to kind of observe and learn without any of the stress or anxiety that comes with actually doing it. So it was kind of nice to be able to and, and see somebody who, you know, is a peer and, and realize, okay, well, they can do it. I, I'm fairly certain I'm, I won't screw it up too bad. And I was able to kind of walk the floor several times throughout the different days. Got a pretty good sense of the vibe of the, the convention itself and seeing what kinds of people come to this one specifically as opposed to some of the other ones I've been to. I tabled at Salt Lake Comic Con a few years ago. Uh, at Heroes Con once. Um, and I ta I've tabled, I helped table at TCAF one year with uh, Z2 Comics. That was pretty fun. And I t I've tabled at a couple of like little like region, like local comic cons that are like one day, like hotel ballroom kind of com comic cons. Those are, those are fun too. Uh, so what does that add up to? I don't know, I wasn't counting. To me, one of the one of the cool things about Comic Cons, if not the coolest thing, is is finding those people that are kind of similar to you. And that's kind of what as, when I'm at a convention and I walk around Artist Alley. I mean, that's what I'm looking for. And and a place like Heroes is cool because um, there are so it's it's very idiosyncratic as opposed to some other conventions, which are you know they're nothing wrong with that but it's much more focused on Batman and Marvel and um, to whereas this is actually the highlight is like how unique are you um, and so I f you know I, I feel like it's kind of the best place to be to find other like-minded people that are going to be interested in what you do and my expectations are 
I think pretty uh, pretty simple and straightforward and I'm just uh, you know excited for people to to be able to check this stuff out and I mean one of the one of the benefits of writing comics is that at a certain point I can I can be a legitimate fan of these just for the artwork I mean that's kind of the whole premise for a lot of these is that I can't you have to find the right artist for the story that you want to tell and until you have that it's totally pointless so it's pretty cool to be able to um, you know I, I feel like if it was just my own thing that I did it would be very hard to be enthusiastic and go oh you gotta check this out I would never say that <laughs> but I can say like this person is a genius <laughs> stuff in it that just blows my mind um, I mean this this is probably the shortest comic out of all of these. But just like a really simple thing is that if you kind of scroll through it, the colors as it progresses goes from this kind of black and white, kind of dark shades of blue. And then as the story progresses and it gets kind of into the memories, it gets into this warmer tone. Even here is just like subtle hints of it on her face and that kind of bleeds over to this page and now you start to get some color and it just continues and now you get these purple and blue it goes into this green and then finally it like ends in this like you know spectacular uh, orange and yellow and um, kind of this earthy brown and so if you you know put those all in a row I mean you can you can read the story just through the color choice through it and that was 100% I had nothing to do with that <laughs> And uh, when I saw it, I was just like, that's brilliant. Um, and yeah, so, but I mean, all of these have examples of that where, you know, the artist either did something completely on their own or took what was written and kind of the idea and executed it, it exactly as if it was transposed straight from my head into the comic. So, um, yeah, so that makes it, you know, it's, it's as far as like, selling a product it's it's easy when it's i feel like i'm advocating for other people <laughs> not really myself so this is my first convention banner um as you can see the word writer is in quotes which some few people have picked up that that is a subtle um you know self-deprecating <laughs> comment so the idea behind uh the idea behind this was um I guess the question I kind of had was how do you advertise yourself as a writer when you know you didn't draw any of the artwork and so it seems kind of disingenuous to have like those incredible images up here and then somebody walks over and they're like wow you're a genius and you're like yeah I didn't do anything <laughs> um, hey and uh, so then I don't even remember how I got the idea but um, I was like, well, what about a script that basically describes the moment you walk up to the table? So it, I essentially just wrote it like I would write a comic book script. Of, this is the format I use. <laughs> Page one, panel one, convention center day. Describe it and then uh, introduce myself. And then, I, and then, you know, down here you can kind of get away with putting the artwork, at least as far as my mind is concerned like and that kind of justifies its existence on there um, and I think it's the kind of thing where you don't have to read the whole thing really to get it hopefully you can just look and it's like oh I, I get the clever it, it's a comic script format he's a writer and then the rest of it I mean it's, you can read it but it doesn't you don't need that to sell the idea Making it rain? Oh, making uh, little like price tags. Free CD. If that's your thing. If that's your scene. That's this one. And that dude was talking and he kind of did like the spit talk and it got a little dribble of spit on, on it. That's just part of it, man. That's a collector's item. Authentic con dribble. Were you here when the guy was getting on that announcer and he was like, it started out just like kind of general information and then it devolved into like, oh, we're so glad that you're all here, man. If it wasn't for 
your inspiration, like, we'd be, we'd be home playing Pokemon. Oh, that's <laughs> it's like, Dan's like, is he okay. hung over? <laughs> okay. Is this, this is the one where you, like, some friend of yours would, like, nerd it out and said, like, one of yeah. the horses are on it? Yeah. You don't need, this, this flat is redundant because if you have a flat and a measure, it alters every note, ap every one of those notes after it. So this, this flat implies that this one is flat already, so it doesn't need to be there. Bullshit. I try to have a flat display, because uh, it seems like people then get closer, and then you can engage them in conversation. You have a better, likely, more likely chance of getting a sale if you can engage them in conversation. It's better to be genuinely interested in people rather than just trying to sell stuff. That said, like, just chatting with people about whatever can lead to, is, is a better sales technique sometimes than trying to just sell stuff to people. It's always, it's, it's always been really fun, man. I always have a good time and I like meeting new people and it's real like stimulating kind of uh, environment. Yeah. It's weird, I, I, I don't know if I'm an introvert or an extrovert because I feel like when I'm at home, I'm like full on introvert and I just wanna like, I recharge at home alone or just like working just in like silence or whatever. But when I'm here, I get really, I get really like energized by being in this scene. It really like, it's really uh, super fun, man. So, I don't know, what have I learned? Um, stay hydrated. That's it. <laughs> uh, I think I'm. I think I'm good at it. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's just a mat. I think what really helped me is my experience touring with like a rock band, and really do, like being comfortable, like just engaging in conversation with just random strangers and stuff like that, and um, just. I don't know. It's, I, I I think it. I think. Uh, I imagine there is like a, a little bit of there is a little bit of a learning curve. You kind of have to get over your own fear of like looking stupid. You know, like we're at a Comic Con, man. It's okay to look stupid. It's fine. Usually, what I do is I, if someone comes up and is interested, I'm like, I do this. I'm like, you can look through it if you want. And you get it in their hands, they can feel it and get it and, uh, and say like, oh, look, 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 check it out if you want. It's free to look at. And then, uh, and then you can kind of engage, it, I feel like I'm at that point, like, can start a conversation, give them the, the elevator pitch for like whatever they're looking at, you know. Um, and, if, and if it's not that, if it's just someone walking by, then I usually will just, if it, you can kind of like read people if they're like open to kind of like if they seem like they're walking with purpose you just let them go man but if they're like meandering and sort of looking you you say like hey cool glasses i love i love your frames i'm a glasses person you know or like i love your shirt or you know like do you guys know where i can get some comics just something stupid like just dumb idiotic thing you know it seems to be helpful tiered merch Okay, so uh, we'll just go from this side to this side, yeah? So over here, I've got some prints. These are these big Thelonious Monk prints. Um, you want me to tell you the prices? 30 bucks. These are smaller Miles Davis prints um, with like the music notes going around. Uh, those are 20 bucks. These Sonny Rollins prints, 15 bucks. Instrumental, this is uh, my graphic novel that came out two years ago. <laughs> trumpet player finds a horn of which yeah, that makes the most amazing music, but every time he plays it, people die, bad things start to happen. It comes with a soundtrack of music. 20 bucks. Five dollars off this year. Um, this is Let's Go to Utah. This is, a, this is my first like big comic project from like maybe 10 years ago. Road trip gone horribly wrong uh, with lots of fun, wacky hijinks. Violence, 15 bucks. This is my new project. This is like the Heroes Con exclusive. Canopus, it's this um, science fiction story about this woman who wakes up on an alien planet with no memory. 
and she has to find her way off the planet and along the way she encounters her memories but in like monstrous form manifesting on the planet dun 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 this one comes there's only a hundred copies of this they're all signed or they're all numbered with room for me to doodle in it and it comes with this cool black and white print or not black and silver it's like silver ink on black paper and that together is ten bucks I also have some original art here and that's priced on the price of the art depends on if I like you or not and I'll lower the price if you're cool and if you're not cool I raise the price and then these are free free takeaway cards for instrumental with a nice quote on it by uh, one of my favorite artists about the book so it's pretty fun that's it I think it's pretty good a uh, pretty good spread uh, uh, the banner is the cover for instrumental I got it a couple years ago I think and uh, I do a lot of music related work uh, I have my I, I'm a, like that's how I make a living as I'm a professional musician and, and I teach music and uh, so I figured I'd try to use that as like a part of the gimmick on the banner who cares people will probably look at it and be like wow that's weird come over starting on the left there I've got a book called Saltwater which I did with an artist named Dana Obera. Uh, it's like an action-adventure sci-fi uh, comic. Um, we've got some stickers and buttons that go with that too, which I haven't completely decided. I think I'm just going to give those away it was if people want them. Um, next to that is Earworm, which I did with uh, Martin Lorbiecki, I think is how you pronounce his last name. Uh, it is, it's kind of like, uh, I think I call it like, pop music horror sci-fi. Um, it's part of a, a anthology series that Martin and I want to do called uh, Uncanny Valley, so it's kind of like our, ver our version of like a Twilight Zone or Black Mirror style universe where all the stories will kind of have a shared uh, thematic, uh, shared thematics in them. Um, the Dead Sparrow, which I did with um, Quinn Ray Manning is the artist. And the lettering was done by Adita Bidikar. Uh, that one is kind of a sad uh, fairy tale-ish kind of story. Uh, the Ghost Butterfly, another one I did with Martin. Uh, this one's kind of like post-apocalyptic magical realism is how I describe that one. Um, uh, mostly silent. And then uh, Spirit Drifters, which I did with Eric Whalen, who's tabling next to me, and that one is um, fantasy, very inspired by kind of like uh, role-playing games of like Zelda and Final Fantasy, uh, kind of action adventure, very kind of fun compared to some of the more you know ghost and dead uh, esque titles that I have, <laughs> um, and that's everything. Uh, the idea behind that piece is for the uh, people that are, are shy and maybe don't want to uh, engage immediately in conversation, and they're, if they're curious about any of these books, they can kind of look at that and get a quick synopsis that has a one-sentence plot line, the genre, if you like this, you might like these books kind of thing. Um, the idea behind it was mainly as for myself, like, I when I go up to a table, I'm not the most gregarious and like instantly uh, affable person. And so if I can kind of get a sense of the person or what they kind of have, then it'll, that'll kind of allow me to engage better if I feel like, okay, this, this person is kind of on the same wavelength. Um, so we'll see if it works. Honestly, I mean, I'm just going to kind of draw from my years of working in customer service and just knowing how to kind of engage with strangers when they come up to a table and when it's a, you know, like a transactional kind of thing and they have a lot of questions or, or um, you know, if, if for whatever reason it becomes awkward. I, I have a lot of experience just like being calm and, and uh, 
you know, not letting it like weird me out. I mean, after years of working in customer service, I've seen every possible horrible situation <laughs> I could be in. So I don't have any worries about any any like awkward kind of thing. And then um, it's just a matter of, I guess, you know, engaging people and giving them their your full attention and not, you know, on my phone while they're trying to talk to you. I mean, uh, I feel pretty privileged and it's kind of an honor to have somebody come up and have any interest whatsoever. So, um, you know, I want to respect that and, and engage with them. Uh, my expectations uh, for the first day are, I would say, low and realistic. I mean, I, I certainly hope that people buy a few, but, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's going to be, <laughs> like, the doors open and uh, suddenly uh, there's a cartoon cloud of smoke and everything is gone and I have, you know, uh, Scrooge-like bags of gold coins. <laughs> oh man, I couldn't even lost keep, count. Yep, <laughs> lost count on that whole deal. It's like uh, I used to come to Heroes Con before I was a professional, so it was one of those things where. I had aspirations of tabling, and then I got my first table opportunity. Um, I don't know, that's been 16, 17 years ago, and it's, uh, it's been a blur ever since. <laughs> so, you take that times whatever, you know, um, not just counting heroes, but other shows, it's, you know, hundreds, probably even close to a thousand times now. I mean, for me, I used to walk around a lot, and visit the tables and as a fan, but when I started self-publishing, started getting my first table after that, I didn't want to be just walking around anymore. I wanted to sell my books and interact with people buying my books and really be a part of the professional life. So yeah, countless, countless tables, countless tables. Interact with people, you know, um, talk to them, let them know what's going on with your, with your life and your work. and. Um, Kind of be patient, you know, and have fun and enjoy the process. You know, don't worry too much about sales or, or you know, making it big. Just be in the moment and enjoy it. It's a little different now because you have the internet. The internet changes everything, right? So you now can literally have a con in your in your bedroom. I know it sounds kind of weird, <laughs> but there's nothing like that one-on-one, -on -one, you know, yeah. attention as well. So it's one of those things where you know. The experience of having that con those connections in the conversation is what you know allows you to uh, to really grow. Well, I'll start when I first started out and, and was in a place where you know I wanted to to get in the industry. It was one of those things where um, the, the feedback was invaluable, but it's humble, you know, because I knew that I needed to grow you know, from the instructions that were, or the feedback that I got. And it just, you know, it invigorated me, but at the same time, it, it definitely, you know, made me um, realize how far I have to go. So I, you know, I basically, uh, it made me work harder, thank goodness. It could have crushed me, but it made me work a lot harder. And uh, I think, um, Without losing my train of thought here, I think I've just got a lot of stuff happening. That's yeah. what. T see, another part of aspect of tabling is when you are trying to do something like this, and then you got fans coming up, and you're like, okay, I gotta juggle a little. But um, at the same time, I think um, for me, just getting that feedback at, at the beginning, you know, from the Brian Stell freezes, from the uh, uh, the Adam Hughes's, you know, folks of that nature, they really helped me. 
uh, understand what it took to be a part of this, this industry. For me, as a, as a writer, I had um, like finished self-published books on the table. So when other professionals came in, they had to see the whole process from beginning to end, my writing, how I managed the team, the lettering, and I got to get a real good critique on everything, good and bad. So that's been a huge jump, you know, coming up with tabling other professionals coming over every now and again and saying, hey, this is kind of cool. The lettering is a little here, you know, maybe you need to make some tweaks on that, and, well, you kind of didn't go full bleed here. So you get all these different angles of, um, of critiques. And, and, and even today, even though we table and we sit here for like 80% of the time, there's that 20% of the time where we are fans of other colleagues and we go to their tables and we also go to up and coming tables, people that we know. And, buy their books and get and give them feedback if they ask for it. So that's a that's another aspect of it. you know also you know kind of collaborate with other professionals, not just the fans that come to the table. What we're doing now is it's kinda of, it's kinda of full circle because what we're doing now is one of those things where um, uh, the book that we're working on right now is getting a lot of attention and it's pretty exciting to be able to see the it's kind of a full circle because I remember days of having aspirations of man one day I would love to be able to have a project that everyone notices and, and reveres or, or what have you um, and um, now to see it kind of come to fruition and, and you know we're by no means you know uh, at the, the peak I think I think we you know, still got a ways to go but just to see the trajectory and understanding that this is how you know where things are going is pretty uh, it's pretty uh, gratifying negative aspects um, when you first start in my opinion or even as you're later in your career when you, when you, you know, get later in your career let's just be honest it's about the bottom line and if you if this is your livelihood and this is where you know you get your income the pressure that can come with that um, can be daunting at times um, because we know that life does not stop and if this is your profession this is your life this is your you know everything and you're not necessarily you're tabling and you're not making the return right if you're not you know making uh, those those returns that can you can be pretty deflated this defeated or, or what have you very discouraged discouraged yeah. Positive side is when you kind of break that that ceiling, because there's a ceiling there that you have you have to be persistent enough to be willing to keep pushing, and when you break through it, it's and you get on that other side, it really is pretty like wow I can walk away from this with an incredible experience because ultimately you meet your bottom line because you're working and your your profession has has grown to a place where people know who you are. They're willing to stand in long lines for you. Um, and I, and I think Sanford brought that feeling like several several years ago. <laughs> and I'm just breaking it like like six months ago. So yeah. like you said, I'm, I'm, you know, you, there's gas, there's travel, there's hotel expenses, there's food. Right. And then you feel, when people don't come up to you and tell me, you also feel that feeling of rejection too. You know, right. worried about that, you know. Right. So um, like you said, on the flip side of that, it's, you really get to connect with people that read your stuff, and like, that's the whole point. So you have people care about your stuff and to read someone. So people come over and say, "Hey, man, your book changed, changed everything." Man, I really love your stuff. Your book is everything, and they love it. That's oh, yeah. that's really that really that really means a lot. Me, you know, you're meeting people from walks of life and that that our work is touching that we never thought it would reach. You know, we had a certain demographic, just being honest, that we wanted to represent. But now it's just spreading beyond that, you know. And we have people literally coming to us um, with lots of emotion, you know, uh, about how what we're doing, our work, and how it's affecting them. So, you know, it, that is probably the big, you know, it's about the bottom line. But when you have those fans literally like living through your work, um, getting inspired through your work, and they come and tell you just what it means to them because they they were in a certain place and then they read what you did uh, or saw your art and it just made them inspired to just keep going and pushing man you can walk away from these things you know on a very high note and it just gives you that much more energy to 
to, to do more of this. To go home and write, you know, to go and, home and draw, draw and draw and create. Give it some thought. If you decide not to get it, you can take this with you. Buy it on Amazon.com on the internet. Give some money to Jeff Bezos. That oh yeah, I just forget I'm part of the system. We're all for accommodating. Look, man, we're all part of that. So uh, I've been working on two things today. So th this one was like a Dark Knight Returns homage, but using Spencer and Locke characters. My auction piece, which is this one, what I want to do is um, I, I want to draw like a big explosion behind them because these guys get into a lot of trouble. So I wanted to draw like his raging inferno behind them. Spencer like patting the fire off of his trench coat and Locke just covered in like burns and stuff. And I'm gonna put a speech bubble up here that says, you're under arrest. Cause I just like the idea of just like they're over it. Like, guess what? The building exploded. You're still under arrest kind of thing. Yeah, commissions are tricky for me. Like, cause like, I do really well with panels. I love, I love telling stories like this, like, you know, um, close up of this, and then a pullback, and then another pullback, and then a super pullback, and then a close up. I like the cinematography of panel to panel storytelling. Like, that's my jam. You know, and so like, it's a lot harder for me to um, make one page, one image, like really super dynamic, but I can do, Give me eight panels a page, and I'll be like, "Oh yeah, no problem. I'll figure this stuff out." Because uh, yeah, like yeah, I I just love cinema the cinematography of comics and like playing around with like the layouts. Like, oh, how does the layout tell you the story just as much as the art does? So my my thesis was studying panels and studying the the relationship to panels on the page and how I can use those to my advantage to help tell a story. How you can vary up um, panel shapes to sort of imply. Like uh, like uh, Becky Cloonan does this in one of her um, her uh, her books that won the Eisner Award, like the, the Meyer, the the short comic. There is a scene where there's this mummy who's got a, a blade like jammed into her chest, and the panel it starts wide because you're looking at her face, and then it funnels down right to the blade. Like that's like a like a, a pan in on something. Like it's it's like only comics can do that. You know, even even if you try to do it like in in a great movie like. Um, like uh, enter uh, the Spider Verse movie. Like they use panels to their advantage for sure. But like because the the, 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 the the screen is still a you know, they can only do so much with it. But with panels, you know, I can do a vertical panel with those or a horizontal one. You know, and I don't have to lose you in a panel. Like I can I can control the way the reader um, reads the page if I direct the, the action in certain ways, which is fun. I love it. Like it's. It's like uh, when people say like, oh, this is how you make, you know, comics allow people to make a movie with only like four or five people on a team. Like, I think panels is what allows you to do that. Like, because if you do like 20 pages of just splash pages, it's just 20 illustrations. But the panels, that's what makes comics special. That's what makes them cool. And that's where you're, that's where I want to learn how to play with stuff even more. I've tabled. I want to say this is probably around my 30th show, maybe, maybe a little more, a little less, give, give or take another five. We'll say. My first ever table experience was when we announced the book in New York Comic Con in 2016, and I was woefully unprepared. I, uh, we just announced the book, nobody knew who we were, um, we had announced the book 
that day. And all we had was a $10 con exclusive variant. It was a sneak peek of the whole first issue. Um, didn't have any prints, didn't have any banners, didn't have anything. <laughs> you just have to kind of throw yourself into it and just, uh, you have to sort of make the first step, uh, the first introduction. And it's, you know, there's going to be a percentage of people that don't respond to it or they don't pick up on your particular book, and that's fine. You just have to be the one that makes the, the first overture. I'm naturally a pretty shy person, and um, it takes, I have to really kind of dig in deep to, 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 to be outgoing. And um, it's been practice. I, uh, I got my start, my very first job out of college was I was a newspaper reporter. And, you know, there are a lot of people who get very anxious over the phone. I was certainly one of them. And it's just sort of like uh, exposure therapy. Like, you just keep doing it, and you realize, oh, hey, you're going to talk on the phone. Nothing's going to happen. You're going to, those feelings of unease will subside. It's the same way at conventions. Um, you know, you just, uh, you, you reach out. It's good to have, like, a good pitch in mind. You know, that's something you can practice. Know what you're going to say. Um, for me, you know, I, I tend to say, uh, hey, do you like Calvin and Hobbes? If so, let me introduce you to your new favorite book. It's Spencer and Locke. And that kind of gets the ball rolling. Um, it's a nice little icebreaker. Uh, so I always recommend to people, you know, know what your book is. Um, you know, if there's anything similar to your book, um, you know, uh, I know George with his book ECPD, um, you know, he can say, are you a fan of Ghost of the Shell? And people will be like, oh, that's interesting, and flip through it. Um, and yeah, that's, it's, you know, ultimately the book itself has to, you know, kind of sell itself, but uh, it's up to you as the creator to kind of get your foot in the door. I guess, I think for me, the hardest challenge is figuring out what's controllable and what isn't. Um, there are certain shows where, you know, it's where you're placed and there's not a whole lot you can do about it. If the foot traffic isn't there, the sales aren't there. It's just, you know, and it, you could have the best book in the world, but if you've got not great placement, you know, you don't move numbers. And um, I think for a while, I would really put a lot of pressure on myself um, and sort of beat myself up and say, is this the book? Is this me? And um, I think once you've done enough shows and you've had success with those shows, you start to realize it's not you. It's not the book, even. Um, you know, it can be you. It can be your book. It can be your sales pitch. But if you've had success in other markets, sometimes it's them. Um, sometimes it's bad luck. It just happens. And... You know, it sucks, but like, you know, you can't win unless you play the game. Um, so yeah, I think I think that's sort of the hardest thing. And I think, you know, the, the, the other stuff you can you can figure out in time. Um, you know, uh, figuring out your pitch, for example. I've done numerous iterations of the Spencer and Lock pitch, uh, numerous iterations of going to the chapel. Um, I consider them both to be works in progress still. I, you know, you'll 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 get to read some of the space a little bit and uh, and you'll say, oh, you say this one thing, and they'll kind of frown. You'll be like, okay, that's not something I want to compare my book to anymore. Um, you know, whereas they'll sort of, if they laugh at something, you're like, okay, I'm going to remember that. So a lot of it is just a work in progress that you'll, you will keep uh, finessing and you'll keep improving upon. Um, and in that regard, I always recommend people just get your reps in. Um, just do as many shows as you can, do as many pitches as you can, um, because that'll quickly teach you what works and what doesn't. It always feels fun meeting a stranger and being able to sell them on your book, but what's even more rewarding is when they come back and tell you how much they like the book. Um, and you know, we tend to get that a lot with Spencer and Locke. Uh, you know, early readers, uh, people who buy the books on Fridays and Saturdays, they tend to come back on Sundays and really rave about the book, which is nice. Um, because that's the reason I do these shows. It, it, you know, I, I, it's not about making the money, it's about forming the relationships, one reader at a time. And uh, being able to sort of put that connection, we, you know, we've had readers come up to us from other shows, and I'm and, and being able to recognize them and say, hey, I remember you from Denver, I remember you from Baltimore. Um, that I think it's that personal connection that gets you. It doesn't. It turns readers into fans, um, and I think that is what's so important about these shows and the reason why I do them. Um, and uh, yeah, I just find that very rewarding. Yes, he explained the book to me, the Sailor Moon book. The Sailor Moon book I am using to track uh, my sales. And so I've denoted that these are the numbers for Friday, and so I'm going to keep them separate just to 
for the sake of um, seeing how each day kind of pans out, and then I'll add them all together. Let's see how it is. Let's get some more magic in there. I think since you were last here, all I got is another banner comment. Oh, yeah? Yeah, so it's slowly creeping up. It's got one more to go before it was tied for number one. <laughs> I'm actually kind of rooting for the band right now, so. How goes the Doctor Stranging? It's done. This guy has a notebook full of commissioned little sketches of, of superheroes playing musical instruments. And so uh, I have, here we have Doctor Strange playing uh, a song on the trumpet. And the song is the jazz standard witchcraft. Check out, I really like this storm. Oh, cool. Rocks. This is a cool one. It's very cool. Flute, fluting. And uh, here's like, X-Men as a band here, jamming out. Yes! So a guy ends up uh, being able to control his own cancer. Swamp thing vibe. Okay. A bit of like a nod to sort of like Evil Dead style horror movies. Okay. Uh, actually, they get made into a movie. Well, which is down over there in the end of the They start to blend together. I personally. I'm out on the road almost every single weekend. I do close to like 40 shows a year. Yeah, I've tabled everything to a small one day show in Michigan uh, all the way up to like New York Comic Con. So the biggest thing is you, you have to engage with people. Like you have to talk to them, you have to, you have to get them, you have to show them a book. Um, comics and books like don't sell themselves. <laughs> like it just, it's not gonna happen. People don't often walk up, especially because we're an independent press, like you're not, you're not selling Batman, which sells itself because it's Batman. People are into it. They've been into it for decades. Uh, so they're books that most likely people haven't heard of before, they haven't seen, so that's not going to sell itself. Um, so you gotta, you got to engage with people, you got to talk with people, you got to show them the thing. So a lot of my job is actually chatting up people at shows. So and It's actually pretty cool, it's pretty fun. I don't know, I, I think most people would probably, uh, if they know me before, be like, no, that guy is antisocial and not fun to be around or talk to. Um, which I, I think what I probably have to agree with. Uh, so prior to this, I was, a, I was an educator, I was a teacher. So what I use is a lot of, uh, when I go into a classroom, I take on a different persona uh, because I have to, to engage with kids and to get them to pay attention and listen and believe in what I'm trying to get them to believe in. Um, so I just use a lot of like the same methods and ideas. I kind of put on a character, get a little bit out of what I normally am in my comfort zone to start engaging with people and get them to believe in what I believe in, which is, you know, our books, our product line. The negative aspects of tabling, oh gee, it, it can be disheartening when you're having a bad day and when you're not selling a thing and you, you, can, you can start to blame the people that are around you. Like the people that are, and it's like you always have to remember, they, they didn't pay to get into this show to buy whatever it is you have. They paid to get in here to do whatever they want to do. So like, it can be frustrating because you're here and you're here and it's a business and you're here and you're trying to make some money and you're trying to make some sales. Uh, so it can be frustrating when that you're not having a good day, you're not being successful, and uh, you gotta you gotta try to fight against like blaming the people that don't want to buy your thing, like not not their fault. You're not gonna have success when you start being angry with people. That is for sure. Oh man, the positive aspect is comic fandom, right? I mean, it's spread out now. It's in film. It's in animation. It's everywhere, right? Comic book and comic book fandom is a very inclusive and a generally a very positive group. Um, so it's it's awesome. Like you don't run across like negativity. You don't run across people that are trying to exclude other people in any way. So I mean, you just meet generally a lot of positive people who are on like their little vacations or doing their fun thing. Uh, so like people tend to be like having great times. So people tend to be positive, which usually makes for a decent uh, decent environment to try to get someone to buy a thing. So which is always what I'm after. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. I will be here. Thanks for stopping. Have a great show, all right? Take care. I've probably done about seven so far. Uh, around there, I guess. A couple times a year. It's good to be engaging, um, absolutely. Um, I've 
I try to be more engaging than I usually would be. I, I don't typically go up and talk to strangers, but obviously, you know, you're trying to sell a book. Um, and, you know, just be friendly. And uh, if someone comes over, just strike up a conversation. See what they're into, what kind of comics they like. It seems to go, go a good way. Writing is a very, very solitary, quiet thing, and you know, you're in your own world with your book and story, and then it's all, it's all there in your head, but then you have to come out of that world into the real world and try and get people to buy into what you're trying to do. So, so yeah, it is, a, it is a bit of a shift, especially like if you're in, heavily into the creating process. It's very, very quiet, very solitary, like I said, and then you have to come just do a complete 180 and say, all right, now I have to be social and get out there and pitch and, uh, you know, so yeah, it's uh, you get you, just once you shake off the rust, uh, you know. Once you start day one, a couple hours in, usually you get the get the flow. Um, so Samurai Grandpa is the story of an old samurai who wants to uh, retire. He wants to live out the rest of his days with his family. He comes back from putting his sword away and finds out that his granddaughter has been kidnapped by his greatest foe from his past. And now he has to set out one last time to bring her back. It's a little bit Samurai Jack meets Old Man Logan. If someone comes over and uh, you know, I'll talk about I'll talk about the story itself. Um, I mean, Sean Daly is the artist on it. He does beautiful watercolors. Um, so sometimes that is a selling point in itself. So I usually will bring that up as well. Um, yeah. So if you know if they look interested, you just kind of say if you're into samurai stories, if you're into fantasy stories, this is definitely something that would probably be up there, alley. If you meet a variety of different people, that's for sure. Um, you're a little bit of a captive audience at times. Um, it just didn't. Ha it, it's not really a negative thing, but it was. It was a sort of a funny thing. I was with. Um, I was in New York at the time at a con, tabling with an artist. Uh, the artist on another book I do called Hal. It's a werewolf apocalypse story, um, and he was taking commissions. You know, day of commission. So someone would come and order something and come back a couple hours later, and the person. The person didn't want to come back for it, so he wanted to watch the artist Dan draw the commission for like two hours straight, and he hovered over him the entire time. So that was that was a little bit awkward, and it was a little bit strange. So I guess not not totally negative. It, it was funny looking back on it, but we were we were kind of like, okay, uh, I guess I guess we're just gonna roll with this one, see see what happens. The positive is just like just talking to people. Um, they'll come over, you know, you meet, like I said, on, on the flip side, you meet you meet so many different people at cons, um, and they're all here, they're all just looking to have a good time, they're looking to read, they're looking to do things they love, cosplay, look at games, cards, you know, comic books, and it's just so cool being, uh, being in that environment. Um, everyone's here just to have a good time and willing to talk and chat, and you know, it's cool, you get a, you get a little moment here and there with everyone, so it's a lot of fun just meeting different people. Like, uh, 
it's good it's a good way to reach out to other creators and again like your work is attractive so like like um, reach out with confidence and say like and you know ask them to check out your stuff what's, what's your name again Bill Chris what's your two L's yeah, two That's right. I got my card. You can have it again if you'd like. I probably gave you some uh, I didn't get that. Okay. So I appreciate it. I appreciate you getting my book, man. Did I get you change Absolutely. already? Huh? I gave you change, right? You gave me the change, yes. The rip, the rip 10. I'll cherish it. I won't even spend that one. You way. should spend that oh. one. <laughs> You're here. Whoa. It's in the teens. Is it? We've been doing this since 2015. Yeah. A bunch of shows on the West Coast. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is our first East Coast and Southern show. Everything else has been like California and, uh, Oregon. and Oregon, yeah. And then once in Chicago, which was dope. Yeah, so I'd say about a dozen times. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. I would say every show is different, even yeah. ones you've been to before. Different crowds of people, people feeling different things. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's bad news out in the world, you know, people are less likely to want to buy, or, yeah. you know, if it's closer to a holiday, maybe they're more likely to. It's just kind of like, you know, take it as it comes. Yeah, it's, there's always weird market, like, volatility. Like, we, we tabled during, uh, during the election year, uh, and we were like, all right, so it, sales are probably not going to be great. Uh, and then for one show, uh, like WonderCon was like really, really rough. No one was buying books. But then we did another show in uh, Southern California that was fantastic the same year. So like talking with people and getting uh, a general idea and general feeling for what the show looks like and what kind of things are usually bought is really helpful. But then always keep it back in mind and being like, just don't throw all your eggs into that basket because yeah. they'll throw you for a loop like shows that are supposed to be all books all of a sudden people really want to buy prints yeah. like they'll they'll buy books but it's it's a it's a grab bag you never know but i will say that every show we've made connections with people yeah. whether it's folks buying our book or other creators and that's always great you never know if you're gonna meet like a great friend or someone to collaborate with later yeah. or you can share some tips with. Yeah. And I think that is really like what makes it so valuable. Yeah. And one of the uh, the most important thing that I uh, piece of advice that I ever got uh, was from the great Jeff Parker, uh, one of the greatest human beings who's ever lived. I genuinely mean that. I love that man. I think he's wonderful. Uh, but he he. Uh, and he tells us, everybody, uh, when you're tabling, just be yourself. Uh, don't try to be somebody else. Um, just be professional. Talk to people if you want to. If you feel a, a little more introverted and you want to just sit there and you want to do your art, that's fine. But then be who you are and then stretch yourself a little bit. Uh, and then you know try to keep stretching yourself like incrementally until you get to a point where you feel comfortable having just like a general conversation with people. Uh, or just like as someone's walking by saying hey uh, and then just kind of bringing them in to, to try to sell your book uh, and that's something that's really that really resonated for me uh, because I didn't know how to sell my book at first and after a while I got really really used to it and now I, I've got it down um, and then I don't know it helps it helps to just be yourself but then stretch it a little bit I had other versions that were more offensive. <laughs> um, I really wanted to be offensive. No, uh, I, I, because I'm a writer, I don't know what, what to put on there. Um, so the, the image is from the book uh, Tethered that we, we did. Uh, I, I talked with Danny, the artist, uh, and I asked him if it was okay for us to use the image, and he was down for it. But I didn't want to just have like a bunch of art on it, because that's not really representative of what I did. Yeah. I mean, I, I wrote what's in the panel, but not really the same um, and I'm also a, a copywriter by trade uh, so I'm used to like writing all of these weird hopefully pithy lines so I, I my wife and I were talking about it and uh, she's like just write down a whole bunch of ideas that like represent who you are uh, and like partially it was just silly stuff partially it was more serious stuff uh, and then we kind of landed on this as being uh, the least uh, offensive and the, the, the also, least likely to for but, me to shit on myself, but also, you know. I think most representative of you. Yeah, yeah. That's the whole thing about being yourself. Yeah, totally. Uh, and I, I 
can't remember. I, I designed it a while ago, but I think we tried to just kind of like create this uniform look with the idea that hopefully someday David will have more books. Yeah. yeah that's been the big question yeah. too, because it's like, all right, well, what do you do next? Like, so we originally had, our first banner was kind of like a, up like a, well, on the front, which was nice. Um, this made a lot more sense as like the next step. But then we keep having conversations in, about what we're going to do our after this. I mean, like, our next book comes out in like, a little more than a year, and it's what, what do we do? We might get an update. I like the idea. I like the idea of, I mean, you can always just keep your same banner, but like having it be able to be like freshed up every every few years with something new, especially for a writer. It, it, but I think it helps. In and if it doesn't, then we'll just go back to this. Now. It's fine. Are we going to need to do that? Fun. Oh, it worked? Okay. They were making announcements and it was loud. <laughs> yeah. Um, I can't stand up for too long. Oh. <laughs> what? Yeah, what yeah. are the negative aspects of <laughs> Oh, I thought you meant of me. <laughs> oh. of, of being at a con, you mean? Yeah. I mean, it can get a little bit, like, repetitious. Like, yeah. you feel like... You're kind of just doing this like Groundhog Day, same thing every day, where yeah. you're like sitting at a table, same setup, you know, same kind of thing. But you know, it's, it's not it's not always fun, but it's those fun moments that make it worth it. What's the positive? The positive. Exactly. That's the positive. What? You're gonna go negative and I positive. I went negative into positive. Ah, uh, I see. I see. Yeah. Uh, man, the negatives. The negatives are. Tricky. Con crud? Con crud is pretty terrible. <laughs> <clears throat> I don't often get it, but today I definitely feel it yeah. coming up. Con crud is usually because you, you end up shaking a lot of people's hands, uh, and inevitably someone has a cold or just got over a cold, and you're going to get a cold. Yeah. Um, flus go through, people get colds, bron bronchial infections. <laughs> it's just. Yeah. It, it's, it's a small price to pay for meeting the fans. <laughs> Uh, bathrooms. Being close to a bathroom is good. Also, because people are like running by and they're like, "What's that?" And then they run to the bathroom and then yeah, they come back so out. High like, traffic. Yeah, always be near a bathroom. You may have already covered it, but can you think of any other positives about I mean, people. Yeah, you meet amazing people. people. Like people who are trying to figure out what they're doing. Uh, like the last two days. Uh, we've, uh, we've met like three people who were like trying to figure it out. They'd never really done a show before, or they were nervous about their stuff. Um, and then just watching as they kind of realize that like not only is their stuff fantastic, yeah. but like they have the real potential to not make it. They could. Oh, anyone can. Right, but like there are enough people who like that. And are going to accept and love it you, and buy it. You can find your niche here. And we were talking yeah. to someone yesterday who was like, "Well, I was drawing a lot, and yeah. I was trying to do more mainstream superhero stuff, but I just, I don't really like it. But I think that's what people want." And we're like, "No, do what you like, do what you love, because people will, will find you. For real. Maybe not at first, but it, they will find you. You'll find your fans. You'll find your people, and that's what you know coming to these things is all about." Yeah, and you, yeah, I love. I love that because that happened to me when I was coming up. Like my first show ever was in Portland and I had a lot of like comics pros be really supportive and I wanted to keep I want to keep that up, keep keep going with that because I mean like comics there are times where comics feels like it's a very insular society and a, a very insular group. Uh, and then other times you remember that the reality is everyone can like comics, everyone can make comics and that's the world that I want to live in. So if I'm encouraging other people the way that I was encouraged, yeah. then we can all just be in the same boat and just have a great time and have it not feel like I'm different than somebody else. It's just we're all enjoying an awesome piece of art. Okay. I was asked to do it, so. Make us an offer, folks, and raise the money for the market. 375 and 400. 375.
This book right here, I've sold 27 copies of this. So it's pretty good, man. Like, uh, it's a limited print of 100 of them, and it comes with, it's gonna come with this little print, so it's like, I'm selling it for 10 bucks. So 27, it's pretty all right. Uh, after one, one day and like 30 minutes, it's pretty strong. I'm feeling good about it. I'm hoping to get rid of all of them. I only have like one published book so far. And you know you want it. I know. I know. It's fine. Don't feel bad about it. It's okay. I love the uh, Debbie Harry Gwen Stacy shirt. It's yeah. cool. Rico Renzi has these. Right on. Yeah. I've seen a couple of those around. Cool. Yeah, they're fun. It's a very Rico color. Very, yeah. That's this book. It comes with an album of music. The music. Also, you? Yeah, I have my, I have my doctorate in music. So. My life is weird, man. That's awesome. You do all the things. All the things. <laughs> well, we'll be in touch. Cool. Do you yeah. have a business card? Uh, I might. Let me see. Do it. Pull the effing trigger, man. Don't drool on my. It's, it's big enough and it looks good enough. It could go in your living room. It could be a centerpiece. That one. I'll cut, I'll cut you a deal if you if you get more than one. Because I just want to get rid of the damn thing. You take card, right? Yeah. I have the uh, square feet. I don't know if this is going to work. If it doesn't work, I can just enter your card. Yeah. Or I'll just get with the times and go to Canada. It is the 90s, after all. This happens. I, if this gets charged multiple times, so email me and I'll pay value. Manual card entry. Do you want a receipt? No thanks. Only 16 easy payments. Oh boy, uh, maybe like six or eight times total. Um, Maybe a little bit more than that. This is my second Heroes Con. The first time I did, I really, really didn't know what I was doing, and I, um, I think the first time I was just sort of trying to get future commissions, so I didn't have anything for sale. Uh, and then at a certain point, I figured out that if I sort of pared down my process enough, I'd be able to actually sculpt uh, and produce finished pieces at the table. So I was able to, to sell those, and that. That was a big game changer, as you can imagine. Right now, this is a commission of uh, Jack King Kirby. And uh, I usually, at cons, don't do likenesses because uh, it, it's really hard. Um, but Kirby, I told the guy, I was like, I, I think I got Kirby's face 
well enough in my head that I could do it. So it's, it's always a grab bag. I never know what I'm going to get. Um, this time I've got uh, Kirby, Belle from Beauty and the Beast, um, a few original characters. Uh, one guy wants, there's a guy with a handlebar mustache who wants uh, a Spider-Man with the mask rolled up to show his trademark handlebar mustache. Uh, it's it's really I that's the thing I love is I love opening the door up to commissions and just people tell me what they want and then I gotta figure out how to do it and that's 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 really what I love I love like on the fly just being like okay how do I how do I attack this one I'm working the whole time pretty much I, I try to get up and uh, you know see some of the other artists and some of the other vendors um, a few times but for the most part I'm just sitting here and just doing my work uh, kind of the entire time which is great it's exactly what I want to be doing. Um, Oh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Where are you going to be experiencing this table in the show? Uh, you know, sometimes on on really heavy traffic days, usually Saturdays, sometimes, depending who you're sitting next to, um, there can be like a line that wraps around your table, and there are people who, you know, and that sort of can't be helped, but... Um, but then sometimes you know you'll have people that are sort of lined up blocking your table, and then they'll just like start putting their stuff down on your table. And you're like, okay, all right, like come on, <laughs> like help, you know, help me out here. This is like, you know, I, I'm actually doing something. This isn't this isn't just a place for you to store your stuff. That, that's probably the worst. It's just great because um, everybody is always so friendly and supportive. And people, I just sit here doing what I do and people come up all day and, and say nice things to me. So like, of course I love it. Um, plus I get to see all these other amazing artists, you know, surrounded on, on all sides by great artists. Uh, I get to see all these uh, creators whose, whose work I grew up with and is so meaningful to me. Um, it's just, it's really all, all up, it's all positive. I love, I love tabling, I love uh, coming to conventions and Heroes is my favorite. I've um, been doing shows for probably around like 16 years, so um, this is kind of like, but I kind of do more of the, uh, the bigger ones from like San Diego to um, New York, uh, Seattle, like a lot of like Denver, like some of the, like the other ones. Uh, this, I'm trying this one for the first time. So. What I've learned, the hardest part is like trying to like want to be like somebody else. I think that's the, the one of the hardest things that I had to learn was trying to look because you come into this with huge dreams of trying to be like somebody else like because you wanted to be like because that's what you grew up with and then trying to kind of be like them or be um, have to work with them or something like that and then you find out that that's not necessarily always going to happen and it's not always going to be easy and then when they do they're always and then it's also that you have to compromise your who you are in order to be what like what you wanted to be, which you didn't know at the beginning, and then um, so I think one of the hardest lessons I learned was that, that I had to make a choice. You either you either want to be just like them, and or you or you choose to be yourself. And um, I chose to be myself, which is uh, it's not an easy route. It's definitely a harder route, but it it's more fulfilling and I'm happier because of the choice I made. And that's um, I think a lot of us had to do that in order. Uh, the younger generation. I came up from looking at the 90s guys had to make a choice and so we all had to make a choice as we see like a lot of the younger guys like me have highly stylized work and it's it was it was because we were not getting attention looking like everybody else so and then we weren't getting um, and we couldn't succeed doing this by looking the same because the guys that looked the same had the books to back up their their work right had the cover work had the interior work to back up the work and then in order us for us to succeed in this these type of situations was to be different and that's what helped us grow a fan base and on top of like the online community which is like you looked at back in the day it was like dvnr and dvnr turned into like Tumblr and then Tumblr turns into Instagram where everybody is at now kind of thing and that's uh, but that, and that helps a lot too but like but at the show I think the, the main thing was just making making a stand and being being yourself is what what stood out in comparison to most people and I think that's where I think that that was the biggest lesson that I've learned was you know, like you making that choice of so just being you being being you and just giving them help and I think that's the best um, 
best thing you can do. When it comes down to it, the fans are the most important thing to me, and then and I think that that is the and they've made me who I am because I wouldn't be who I am as an artist or this the way I am without them giving me the the confidence to continue down this road. If I was speaking to a younger artist, I'd say. The idea of a pop culture convention is that word, it's pop culture, you know, so, so like, I, I understand that most of our artists want to come here and they want to, like, be the next big thing, which is, like, put up my own personal thing and build it up and be it. That is soul crushing. <laughs> I've tried it, and I've, 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 a lot of dudes have tried it, and there's a small percentage that are really successful, but uh, I can... We could probably count the number of people in there with our hands that have actually made it out of that, right? Yeah. So, um, so the idea is that when you want to come to these things, you want to be like, you want to be able to cover cover your expenses. You want to be able to also it's a business, and you want to be able to cover your expenses, but also meet fans. But like, you have to have that connection between the fan and you. They already like if they like your artwork, if they like your artwork, but they need to know why do they like your artwork. It's not like, and the personal property is cool. But it's a really hard sell when they don't have a connection to you already. So yeah. like when like so it's like I would I would my advice would be build a fan base before you start shopping around a you know, what, actually, you know? I, and building a fan base comes and with so pop culture. I was so and I would say I don't think you can I don't think DC or Marvel would ever say this, but I'm pretty sure they use this as a farming system. So it's like we're well, AAA. You know, so I'm pretty sure that this is how they find their talent. And I don't think anybody will say that. So they're not gonna stop you from doing their characters. This is how they find new people. Yeah, I really like, like your work. And you kind of fluctuate some of the stuff on your website too. I noticed like you had a lot of stuff from here, but like there's a lot of stuff we were finding online. Your work I was like, oh my goodness. Like, yeah, yeah. The uh, raccoon, there. rocket raccoon, and uh, yeah, root, yeah. like that long stunted yeah. one like this. Like, oh my goodness, that's like the best one I've ever seen. I've lost count at this point. Probably over 10. 10, yeah. 10 shows. Don't get frustrated if you're not making good sales. You know? Remember that you're there to have a a good time don't carnival bark at people you know know what it is that you're selling and be enthusiastic about it but not abrasive you get to network with a lot of people um, learn new things about what to do with your comics what to do with shows um, it's just good for uh, building community and you do reach some new people it's not a lot but you know every new reader is uh, it's good for uh, momentum. Uh, we have here our anthology that kickstarted this current iteration of our group called Media Rex, and in it there are four stories that span uh, different genres. We have uh, horror, science fiction, fantasy, uh, some kind of psychedelic adventure story, and then we have Seed, which is a self-contained one-shot. Uh, it's it's Dr. Seuss meets David Lynch. Yeah, it's this weird, great little story, and it was originally done as a silent comic through another publisher in, in Houston. For those who don't know, that's where we're from. And uh, he brought it to us. Didn't have any dialogue, so we uh, we decided to put a script to it. Pizzo, the guy who created it, said nobody's supposed to be speaking English so we compromised and we gave them all alien dialogue and subtitles so it was a fun little thing to do and that's that's really kind of the ethos of the group is we've run into a problem what do we do to uh, get around it and Richard will probably have a couple things to say about how he busted his hand when we were putting together the first issue of Immedia Rex I am the co-founder and guy who gets away with doing all the easy stuff of Pulp 21. This is a comic I had originally started writing about 20 years ago. And uh, had a friend who was an artist that I really wanted to work with, so I pulled it out. And it's an adventure through a world of uh, underwater. And the revenge story to hunt down their god who has killed his mother. I, I really wanted to work with the guy, so I just 
put it back together and put it out. And that's kind of the Pulp 21 ethos. At its core, is just kind of do it. it. Doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be done. And if it happens to be perfect like that, then all the better. The first time I tabled was the weekend uh, Marvel Civil War came out on DVD, and we happened to be placed right next to Steve McNiven. And I learned uh, don't expect a lot of throwaway trim. People are in the line for what they want, and they're going to get it. Shoot off to the next thing. So don't be too close to the gold mine. That's, that was my takeaway. Getting to meet people, you get to learn a lot just by walking and seeing what people are doing and the exhibitor's badge certainly gives a, gives you a little bit of an in, enough of an in, somebody might open up and talk to you a little more than they would somebody who's just got the day pass. And uh, so everything's a learning experience going in and that's that's a positive and a negative unfortunately <laughs> right right you can, you can take in too much uh, my name's Deb and it's a kind of a family affair here so we came up with the crafty kitties name for our booth this year um, and we so it's um, kind of a collaboration between me and the rest of the family coming up with a lot of uh, mostly fan art so uh, my kids are 12 and 15 and so there's a whole lot of things that they're interested in. Well so this is the, uh, this is one of the things that they like the Fortnite game and so it's part of the game and you loot the lob in the game so we creep. I, I like experiences so this is interactive to me so we have fun stuff in there inspired by the game and we get to interact with people that stop by because they're actually looting the llama. This is only our third. We Last year we did Heroes Con, that was the first one to try it, and everybody liked it. Uh, and we've done two, we did one other, and then we liked this so much that we came back this year. Yeah. I think it's hard because you think you know what people will respond to, and then it changes or you guess wrong, and so I, I don't know that I have that wisdom yet. <laughs> Godzilla and Godzilla and Kojira. The background texture is not falling, but it's this really cool medium that creates this like, like organic sort of texture. And then I take that into the computer and do some manipulation. Oh, will you uh, sign that? Yes. Wait, so uh, you'll sign On the dark? Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, something to have the Godzilla. Sure. Yeah. There's a demon on it. The kids are asking me, they're like, which one do you think is going to sell? And I'm like, I don't even know. I think if I guess that one, I'll be completely wrong. So that piece, I don't know how to figure out what will connect. Um, but I like that too, because there's a variety of people here, and it's neat to have people connect with different things. So I, I enjoy it. This is fun, having artists kind of do the, just encouraging artists of all ages. Like, I like to see what everybody's up to. Um, I will say location is kind of funky, right? Like, so last year I had, like, the spot over there and half my spot was eaten by another table. And so, like, that's kind of, like, there's luck, right? There's, there's luck of the draw. And so that, that's kind of frustrating. Whereas, like, there's a ton of space over there. So that has not been my favorite thing. It's hard to plan until you know your space and then of course you want the full space. I like wandering and meeting everybody and like that's the fun thing because there's such a nice variety of artists here and so I really like seeing what everybody's up to and having being here for three days having the time to go and check everything out and explore and get to meet people. That's, that's really fun. I think that's inspirational to see what other people are up to. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Jordan Elseka. I am a comic writer. I have written numerous sci-fi, fantasy, slice of life, all kinds of things, and uh, currently working on a number of different pitches for public, hopeful publication. This will be my fifth time tabling at a convention. Uh, this is my second time at Heroes, uh, and I've done a few local shows, some that are like 
I wouldn't call them tabling. They're like, you know, free comic book day event type thing. So, I mean, I do a similar setup, but, you know, this is about fifth major convention, I would say. The biggest I've learned is it's important to engage as much as you can. Not, not, don't, don't be like a carnival huckster of like trying to pull people in. But if you know, someone makes eye contact or they're looking at your table, you let them know if they can pick stuff up or, you know, ask how their weekend's going. Uh, as far as layout, you just want to... Depending on your space, if you have a half table or a full table, you want to fill it purposefully uh, mm -hmm. without being... Cluttered is better than empty, I've found, because like people like a lot of things to look at. They like the ability... Because some people are going to want to talk to you directly. Others will wait until you are talking to someone to like look at your stuff. And I say that because that's what I do, because I get intimidated by people I, I, whose work I like. Um, so I think it's a matter of table management and then just being engaging. So for this display... Um, I have all my books on this single four-tier um, display, and I forget the exact website. It's like uh, display. It's basically like displaystands.net or something like that. Uh, and I try to space the books out so that they're all visual. I have like the things I am either proudest of or that need like the headspace at the top. Whereas like down here, these both have the bottom logo, so I kind of put it where people can see the titles the easiest. I have this out because. I feel like the cover gets blocked, so I have just like this copy, and it's the biggest thing I've got. Um, and I like the pins. I have a little pickup board, so if people want to see the pins and buttons closer, they can take a look. Um, and then stickers and pins just sort of spread out. I got my business cards so that they're the easiest thing to grab. Uh, and then this space was supposed to be filled by the artist, uh, but since she wasn't able to make it, she sent ahead some of the original art for our book and pre-signed copies, so I just have had... I've been switching it throughout the weekend of like a page of art compared to the page in the book. Um, so I just try to give so that there's room so multiple people can see different things. Um, I think the biggest is just you're, gin you're gonna see the vast majority of people walk by. Not even necessarily, most people are gonna walk by just because they're cutting through, they're going somewhere specific. But sometimes you'll have people that are just, that'll come up and you'll say something and they'll like look and then they'll just walk off without a word. So I mean, and that's just people's personality. Some people are bad at social interaction or they're, they're just like that. But it can be a bummer when someone like, you, you specifically like try to engage them and then they wander off. Uh, so, but you also have to have a thick skin about it because tabling at a convention, you're not going to sell every person. You're not going to sell even most people until you're like, unless you're like a name and, and you are pulling in a lot of people just specifically based on you. But when you're starting out, um, outside of like the few people that know you, you're basically a nobody and you're, you got to feel happy about the people you get. My favorite thing about getting to table is I have a lot of people that come up that already know me or that... You know, back to the projects on Kickstarter, but I love when someone who doesn't know who I am from anyone else comes up, sees a book, and really likes it. Um, beyond that, my favorite thing with uh, We Have to Go Back and then the anthology, Electrum, is getting to see people see themselves in the work. Like, especially Electrum, because it's all mixed race creators. I've had people come up and be excited to see that because. I mean, mixed characters don't necessarily get focus in TV shows or movies or representation uh, as directly because a lot of times it's very mono, you know, it's like you're either a white person or you're black or, or whatever. Whereas in this, um, it's about those mixed experiences. So seeing people connect with stuff and get excited about things and knowing that I was able to help them feel that excitement is, is really uplifting. You gonna buy this? Come on, man, you know you want it. Get a job. <laughs> Kid. Yeah. Kid, man. Don't ever get a job. Work sucks, man. Remember. Let me sketch something for you. What do you want to sketch up? Tell me, man. That's, that's weak, man. Give me a topic. Best one in there is from Sergio. Yeah, look at that. It's beautiful. Oh, wow. Right on. I'm gonna draw this dude. No pencils, man. It's like a uh, tightrope walking. Here's this. Thank you so much. Have a beautiful day. Awesome, thanks. Great to meet you guys. You too. Tell both your friends. Oh.
I've been coming to Heroes Con for a long time, since the early 90s, so um, just I didn't start this particular book until 2005, maybe. Um, but I had a previous book that I brought, and I just didn't have any theme at all. I just got different um, drawings from different artists, whatever they felt like drawing. <clears throat> I never really requested anything, but so I started. I decided I'd seen other art collectors go with something more theme oriented. So I ended up going, deciding to go with the Joker as one of my favorite characters growing up, and I just figured that he's someone who everybody can do their own unique take on. You know, everybody has their own style, and you know that's the great thing about comic art is you know, seeing people's different takes on some things. It starts out with one by Guy Davis. Um, really cool and uh, yeah I love that he inscribed it with my name there I didn't even ask for that but he did it's kind of a cool kickoff to the book so um, a little bit of everything you know I've got some kind of family friendly type stuff so to speak with uh, Chris Giarusso here Matt Kent here went with a uh, you know kind of a watercolor this particular book um, I started in 2009 Jim Mafood when he did this he did the whole Joker he did this part with a big, fat, black, permanent Sharpie, and then he turned around and laid the book on the ground behind the table and just held it open and then started just slinging the Sharpie like that to get that effect. So, very cool, you know, really neat. This is one of my favorites. Um, Jason Latour um, kind of did a Rodney Dangerfield um, thing. I really like that Jay Lee a lot. Nick Bradshaw, John Timms, a different take. This one makes me smile. I love the, uh, the grease back look there. Drew Moss. And um, right here, Dave Chisholm. Ink's still drying on that bad boy. I'm actually fairly new to this. Yeah. So uh, this is my first year doing like really big conventions. Normally I do uh, smaller indie shows out in Boston because I'm fresh out of art school. I've only been a year out. And uh, they had a really incredible uh, sort of immersive experience for the students there where they would actually allocate table space only for the students, so to give them a chance to figure out how shows work. Uh, learning the elevator pitch, having an intuition for uh, when you're interacting with someone, how to kind of reel them in a little bit. So much of it, it comes honestly from like retail experience and things like that. And uh, just genuinely like having good people skills, having good conversational skills. And on the business side of things, which honestly so much of uh, freelance art is, uh, you know, learning how to take a budget, learning how to do inventory, how to feel out what crowds might want and what they might not want. Uh, and so much of it is trial and error, yeah. Is that something that comes easy to you or was it something I'm you a to very learn? extroverted person. Okay. And so this is where I thrive. <laughs> I'm very lucky in that respect and I have tabled with friends and other artists who are on the other side of the spectrum. But honestly, when you're behind the table, you kind of have to create a little bit of a persona for yourself. Uh, so, you know, you amp up the charisma, amp up the energy, you have the conversations with everyone who comes through, and it's very easy to, to get in that spirit of it. Because everyone's here for the love of art and the love of comics, and it's such a joy to, to have people, like, you know, interact with your work. Because so much of illustration and working in comics and stuff is, uh, it's very solitary, very, uh, it feels a little bit, you know, you're a little bit in isolation while you're doing your work, and then you show up to a show and you're like, oh, you know, my Twitter followers are real. And they think I'm real for once. And it's it's a very energizing uh, sort of environment. Yeah. So it's very easy for me. It's very exhausting. Uh, you do have to quite literally sell yourself as much as you're selling your work. Uh, unfortunately, it is a bit of a popularity contest. Uh, you have to, people who come already with an audience are already going to have a head start, uh, but as it goes for most things. Um, but, and ultimately there is a little bit of tension, you know, when you wrap up an artist alley and you think you're doing great and you've had a great con and you walk around and you say hi to your table neighbors and maybe the traffic hasn't come their way. Uh, and different people cope with that in their own way, for better or for worse. But you keep your head up, you understand that not every con's a win, uh, and you keep you keep going at it. And you take that experience and you learn from it and you apply it to the next con and the next con. 
getting to have fantastic conversations with folks, uh, having people interact with your art firsthand, getting to talk with little kids who come to your table and giving portfolio reviews. I'm, my background is uh, teaching. I was a high school teacher for a bit while I was in college, and uh, also I was a librarian. And so for me, like that kind of environment is, is so validating and wholesome and fun for me. So getting to, to talk with upcoming professionals and really telling people like the comics community is so warm and inviting and lovely and if you are looking for help and looking for friends looking for peers just even a couple lines of advice people are so ready to help you so what's fantastic about this convention is a very family-friendly convention and some of the artists themselves have brought over uh, some of their kids with them it is Father's Day weekend and that sweet little girl she came up to me to show me her sketchbook and it's an interaction I've had a couple times before but uh, she was so excited to show me her artwork so excited telling me like what all the different drawings were even though they all looked like you know circles with legs sticking out uh, and she she's been I gave her a sticker and then she came back to give me to give me a commission of her own and so the fact that I could create the sort of you know safe welcoming environment for an emerging artist I hope she comes back in 15 years and you know is kicking my ass so that would be like I've done my job uh, so that's that's just a joy. It's why I'm here. Even if I didn't make a single cent all weekend, I'd come back for that. Yeah. There's a couple hours left in the show, and uh, just closing up, like getting ready to like do that last push. Maybe I'll lower some prices. Maybe I'll you know start like get my super soaker out and start blasting people with water. You know, we'll see. <laughs> It's been really good, man. I've uh, made a lot of new friends, made some new contacts, and uh, sold some books, man. So it's, it's been really good. So right now, we are on uh, day, day three of Heroes Con 2019, and we're about halfway through the day. Um, we'll pass three. And, uh, book sales overall, I think, have been really good. Um, Today especially, I think um, uh, today I, is either equal to Friday or very close to, and uh, Friday was better than Saturday, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I have nothing to judge it by, but it seems like it's going okay, and uh, so yeah, it's just kind of, you know, it's fun watching people. and. Meet, you know, uh, fun meeting people and having people look at the, uh, you know, the comics that I've been working on. It's like, uh, that's the whole point. So it's really cool. The act of just kind of sitting still and watching as a sea of people cross by. And I mean, you see people from, you know, and everybody's dressed up. So it's kind of just like a circus or like a Fellini movie. If Fellini directed a comic book movie, uh, it would be about a comic convention for sure. What you working on? I'm trying to get my knee to work again. Iron Fist? Am I on camera? Yeah. Uh, don't want to be? <laughs> I do not give consent. Okay. I don't care.